We will first listen to representatives from Kiribati and Kazakhstan, two effective state parties which have been stimulating efforts on raising awareness about victim assistance, environmental remediation, international cooperation assistance, and all multilateral agreements. Then we will hear from the Marshall Educational Initiative. Furthermore, between 1946 to 1958, the U.S. conducted 67 nuclear tests in the Marshall Islands. These nuclear tests created both long-lasting environmental harm and humanitarian suffering amongst the citizens of the Pacific region. The humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons were not. At the 2010 NPT Review Conference, state parties recognized the humanitarian consequences. In these conclusions and recommendations the for follow-on actions, the conference expressed its deep concern and the catastrophic humanitarian consequences of any use of nuclear weapons and reaffirmed the need for all states and all times to comply with applicable international law, including international humanitarian law. At the 2020 UNPT Review Conference, Kazakhstan <coughs> and Kyrgyz highlighted the need for the state's parties to engage with affected communities and address contaminated environment. Building upon our recognition that So we need to keep pushing for the inclusion of victim assistance and the financial compensation. This is imperative as many of our people are suffering from the nuclear test. The great powers tested, but they need, sorry, the nuclear test with the great powers tested, and we need assistance as a, as a result of that. As contained in our working paper with Kazakhstan, we did make a number of recommendations. I believe uh, Chapter D uh, will go into into detail on this. But let me say that I'm ready to answer any question about what happened in my country. And Kibbes is committed to play its part, especially when it, it was an affected country. He it was affected by the test. And we feel for those who are also affected. 
not only where the bomb, where the test was done, but we even where the material was being mined, and uh, we heard the stories about our friends in, in the United States and others, where the mine was then, and people are affected, the community is affected. We're very human in the city. We're very human. I mean, we're all human, but we're more human than we're very close to nature. Nature is with us every day. We mingle with nature. And when people suffer, and when we see them suffer, we suffer too. That's how we feel. We can be easily affected because of our human nature in the Pacific, the Pacific way. And I remember the UN Charter, Article 6, talks about Pacific settlement of dispute. Now, I've been asking people, why did they put the word Pacific settlement of, instead of peaceful settlement of dispute? There must be a reason, and I think the reason is that that's the reason why I'm mean, from the Pacific. I think we have a role to play to tell the world, be like the Pacific people one day. You don't have to fight when you're in the Pacific. We don't believe in fight. We believe in peace. We believe in reconciliation. We believe in talking. When we see trouble or signs of trouble, we come straight, pour water on them, make it cool and nice, and get everybody dancing and happy again. That's the world we want to see. I know it's not like that now. It's not been like that for many hundreds of years, but the Pacific is already there. And if you want to know more about, come to the Pacific, be with us, be on Christmas Island, and you will learn more about it. So thank you again. I hope we have a have to say. Thank you, Christian. Uh, thank you, Ambassador Sita, for your statements. Uh, dear ladies and gentlemen, uh, excellencies, colleagues, uh, thank you very much for joining us today, uh, for spending your precious time for this side event on, on uh, the issues of uh, the humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons. Uh, as we meet today, uh, let us recall that since the time of the first, uh, the first uh, nuclear uh, weapon was detonated in 75 years ago in 1945, at least eight nations have carried out a total of 2056 nuclear tests, around one quarter of them in the atmosphere, causing long-term harm to human health and survival. <coughs> and the environment and the planet. As the international campaign to abolish nuclear weapons, ICANN has stated, more than 60 sites around the world bear the scars of these tests. Even just the 528 atmospheric tests had a destructive power equal to 29,000 bombs than the one just delivered in Hiroshima, despairing radiative particles far and wide, poisoning the environment for all times. And my country is another example of, of such a uh, uh, negative impact of, of radiation, uh, the environmental uh, contamination, uh, after the 256 nuclear tests carried out at uh, the Semipalatis nuclear test site. And around one and a half million people uh, were affected by this uh, testing. Uh, people uh, could ask what is the uh, connection of, of these issues with the NPT where we are gathering this week. Um, we can recall the 2010 action plan of the NPT review conference where the uh, humanitarian impact uh, uh, has been uh, stressed and uh, states parties expressed their concern over this issue and after that uh, there uh, have been four conferences on nuclear uh, weapons, uh, of, uh, on humanitarian impact of nuclear weapons, uh, humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons. And finally, in 2017, the uh, Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons uh, was adopted, and now it's uh, in force. 
And people also could ask why Kazakhstan and Kiribati, uh, two different countries from different regions, are working together on this issue because we share a similar uh, history, uh, a similar uh, tragedy of, of nuclear testing, uh, and uh, people in, in our countries are still suffering. We have in this room a representative of the Simakolatis nuclear test site in the third generation. Uh, you know, uh, our colleagues from Japan, they call all of them Hibakusia because they, they suffered from, from these deadly weapons. And our idea is to continue, uh, of course, uh, raising awareness of, of the uh, negative impact of these weapons uh, in order to prevent a uh, nuclear catastrophe in the future uh, by promoting uh, the TPNW uh, and also to help uh, those who suffered from this testing in the past. And one of the practical ideas is uh, to establish the International Trust Fund and uh, our two states parties are working on, on the modalities of, of this uh, possible enterprise which we hope will uh, bring uh, tangible support to those who are uh, impacted, especially victims of nuclear testing. And uh, of course, uh, my country, we, we have had uh, some experience on, on the decontamination of the polluted areas. So we may share with uh, other countries uh, in case uh, there is such a request. And one of the uh, ideas of this trust fund is to support those uh, who are in need. And uh, we have uh, distributed uh, our working paper for this platform on, on these uh, issues of victim assistance and environmental remediation. Last year at the review conference, uh, we also made a joint statement and uh, we'll, we'll continue this uh, this endeavor together, we join you. Uh, we invite you to join us uh, and support uh, not only the papers or the statements, uh, but support us in, in making a voice or, for uh, reaching our noble goal of uh, a nuclear weapon free world as soon as possible. Uh, I'm happy to uh, be engaged in the discussion, but uh, will let my distinguished panel of colleagues to deliver their statements. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jean Gaudi. So now we will hear from Benedict Kabul Magnussen, the Executive Director of the Martians Education Initiative, who will share his perspectives on nuclear justice. MEI, the Martians Education Initiative, is a nonprofit based organization spring Hill, Arkansas where the highest concentration of Marshall Lees reside in the continental United States. Born in Manchester, Anatol, Madison migrated to the Ozark Mountains of Arkansas with his family at the age of six. His work at MEI includes leading efforts to raise awareness of the biological, ecological, and cultural consequences of the nuclear testing legacy on his, own, on his homeland, as well as the impact of climate change. Benedict has spoken at conferences and events in the U.S. and internationally, including addressing the United Nations General Assembly in September 2022. So please, Benedict, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christian. Good afternoon. I wish to uh, thank the organizers for today's panel, the Republics of Kazakhstan, Kiribati, and the Marshall Islands, the Nuclear Age Peace Foundation, the Reverse the Trend, and the Marsh Peace Educational Initiative, and for the opportunity to speak today. On the morning of March 1st, 1954, at 6.45 a.m., the Marshall Islands witnessed the explosion of the most powerful hydrogen bomb ever tested by the United States. The nuclear device codenamed Castle Bravo was a thousand times the force of the little boy. The atomic bomb dropped on innocent lives in Hiroshima. Those who witnessed Castle Bravo, my elders and ancestors, were scared and confused. My people thought another world war had broken out. Given that the Marsh Islands were a World War II battleground a decade before the Castle Bravo detonation, 
They also doubt Christ was Armageddon, the last battle between good and evil mentioned in the book of Revelation. So people ran into hiding, asking God for forgiveness, thinking it was their final moments together. <coughs> there are many stories from many of the older generations of Marshallese, including our late climate ambassador, Tony de Bruyne, who was a young boy at the time of the Castle Bravo detonation. Mr. de Bruyne said, and I quote, when I was nine years old, I remember well the 1954 Bravo shot at Bikini Atoll, the largest detonation the world had ever seen. It was the morning, and I was fishing with my grandfather. He was throwing the net, and suddenly, the silent, bright flash, and then a force, the shockwave. Everything turned red. The ocean, the fish, the sky, and my grandfather's net and we were 200 miles away from ground zero, a memory that can never be erased, and one of many from the Marshallese, which must inform and underpin global political will on nuclear disarmament." End of quote. My grandparents also witnessed the explosion, including my paternal grandmother, who was only a young girl when she and her people were forcefully removed from their homelands on Bikini Atoll by the U.S. Navy for nuclear weapons testing. I asked my grandmother what she saw that day, and she said everything was red. It was unlike anything they had ever seen. The testing, unfortunately, happened at her home atoll, Bikini, a home she left eight years prior and never will be able to return to. Less than 100 miles away was the atoll of Roar, the people on that atoll would be among the first to experience the nuclear fallout. In the Marshall Islands, it does not snow, as the weather is warm all year round. However, the people on Bromola Atoll that day, including other communities within the impacted area, thought the nuclear ash was snow. The people, especially the children, ate it, and they rubbed it on their hair and body. Soon, the people had skin burns, Hairs fell out, and they experienced other changes in their bodies. Several days after Castle Bravo, on March 7th, the United States sent officials to assess the situation on Romero. Unbeknownst to the people and the leaders of the Marshall Islands, Project 4.1 was underway. It was a secret medical study conducted by doctors from the Atomic Energy Commission, today's U.S. Department of Energy. The purpose of Project 4.1 was not to treat Marshallese exposed to nuclear fallout, but to understand the effects of nuclear radiation on human beings. My people were test subjects, and our homelands became a science laboratory. The American scientists said of my people, and I quote, they are more like us than mice, end of quote. Between 1946 and 1958, the United States conducted 67 large-scale atomic and hydrogen bombs in the Marshall Islands, equivalent to 7,200 Hiroshima bombs. These weapons of mass destructions are not historical incidents, but created a pattern of human rights violations that continues today. Some parts of the Marshall Islands are rendered uninhabitable. People cannot eat traditional food, and some communities cannot live in their rightful homelands in their own country. In the 1960s, women began experiencing thyroid problems, and they gave birth to jellyfish babies. No legs, arms, eyes, mouth, or head. Miscarriages, unfortunately, are common in my community. We also suffer from all types of cancer, including leukemia, colon, ovarian, stomach, and liver cancers. Furthermore, the destruction and contamination of our lands mean that people depend on imported food from the outside world, processed food that contributes to high rates of diabetes and heart diseases. Though we are experiencing these health issues that we know will impact future generations of Marshallese, we have yet to achieve nuclear justice and adequate compensation to address these nuclear-related illnesses that are killing my community. What the United States provided under the 177 Agreement of the Compact of Free Association with the Marshall Islands is unfair and unjust. All the money in the world will never be enough to undo the biological 
ecological, and cultural consequences of the U.S. nuclear testing program on the Marshall Islands. It is why my people and I will continue to play an important role internationally to ensure nuclear weapons and risk are no more. As the pain and suffering inflicted on us continues, and we hope that other communities and countries will not have to experience what we are dealing with every single day. Nuclear weapons do not generate world peace and security. Decades after the NPT was signed, decades after the world experienced heightened threats of the Cold War, and decades after the conclusion of the U.S. nuclear testing program on the Marshall Islands, the risk of nuclear weapons used is higher than ever since the Cold War. The nuclear issue is not only an issue of treaty, commitments, or international law. It is not only an issue of ethics or morals, but it is also an issue of common sense. Our common goal is to el eliminate nuclear weapons. Our common goals to eliminate nuclear weapons must be achieved in our lifetime. And one of the many ways to accomplish this is through storytelling. The nuclear narrative of my people will be shared far and wide to ensure that more people are aware of our experiences and the dangers of nuclear weapons and to join our fight for a nuclear free world. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dante, for those moving comments. Now we will hear from Dr. Ivana Nikola Hughes, president of the Nuclear Age Foundation. Dr. Hughes is a senior lecturer in the discipline of chemistry at Columbia and a member of the scientific advisory group of the TPNW. Thank you, Christian, so much for the introduction and for everything you did to make today's event possible. I also want to acknowledge our many interns in the room who have just been so wonderful and fabulous. Um, and of course, all of the panelists for uh, their um, wise and insightful remarks um, and all of you for being with us today. So I want, let's see. Um, yes, it's working. Um, so the topic of our discussion today is humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons and our knowledge and understanding of the humanitarian consequences of nuclear weapons has grown exponentially uh, since the advent of the nuclear age and it would truly be impossible in one event to tell you everything there is to know about this. Um, and it would be, it's even a harder task to do that in just one of the presentations of the panel. But I'm just going to try to give you three really snippets of what we have learned about what nuclear weapons have done in the past, what they continue to do at present, and what they have the potential to do in the future. And so what I'm going to focus on is what have we learned about what happened in Hiroshima and Nagasaki? That's our past lesson. We heard uh, from Benedict about what has happened to people in, in, the Mar in the Marshall Islands. And what I'm going to stress, I'm going to show um, some actual data uh, from recent years that um, I have been involved uh, in the research and work I have been involved in to show you precisely what Benedict said. He said his grandmother cannot go back to her homeland of Bikini Atoll. And I'm going to show you data that, that, that says why, why that's just not possible. Um, and lastly, as I said, I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the humanitarian consequences of a future in which nuclear weapons continue to exist and um, if you just, if, even if you have something that 
has a very low probability of happening if we keep playing the game, it's going to happen. So the only thing is, are we going to abolish nuclear weapons before they abolish us? So we'll get to that in just a, just a moment. So Hiroshima and Nagasaki, and I want to focus on long-term impacts on health. Of course, we all know here about what happened. We know about the, the flattened cities. We know about the approximately 230,000 people who died by the end of 1945, either from being incinerated, um, murdered in, in immediately as the bombs dropped, um, or from injuries or from impacts of radiation. What is far less known is the way in which that exposure to radiation has impacted people, has impacted the survivors, the Hibakusha, um, to this day. And so what I'm showing you here are actually results uh, from a 60-year-long study of survivors of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. And the data I'm showing here come from Mary Olson, um, who has looked at the data, the collected data, um, and um, made some really important observations about what those data actually tell us about how radiation impacts us differently based on age and based on gender. And so um, what we're looking at in this graph is on the x-axis what you see is the age that people were at the time of the exposure, how old you were when these attacks happened. And then what you see on the y-axis is the increased risk of getting cancer later in life at some point in your life, and this was studied for 60 years. Um, and there are two really astounding conclusions from looking at uh, this graph. The first is that very obviously uh, your risk of getting cancer later in life is far higher if you were younger rather than older at the, uh, uh, when the exposure actually happened. And secondly, there are two curves. It's not one curve, we're not all impacted the same way uh, by radiation. And women at all ages, um, so if you compare um, a 30-year-old uh, male and a 30-year-old female, or you compare an infant, um, at all ages, women are more susceptible to getting cancer. The younger, the larger the difference at uh, the age of an infant, it's twice the rate of cancer later in life. Um, and at age, say, 30, it's a, um, a, a three to two ratio. So really important lesson um, that um, we have to think and be very cognizant about uh, what is even considered to be safe exposure to radiation because it simply does not impact us the same way. So my second lesson, uh, uh, again, um, reverting back to, to uh, Benedict's um, testimony about what happened in the Marshall Islands, I'm just going to show you um, some snippets of data um, uh, uh, about what the radiological conditions are like in the Marshall Islands today. This is work that I have been involved in. But before I show that, let me just show this map just to remind everybody. We heard about Kazakhstan, we heard about Kiribati, we heard about the Marshall Islands, but of course nuclear testing took place all around the world on all of the different continents actually except for um, uh, Central and South America. So from Algeria, if you can see, from Algeria and Africa, um, we have the Soviet Union. So let me, let me back up for one second. This, on this map, the different colors indicate the country that performed the testing. So um, yellow is Algeria and, and French Polynesia, so that's the French nuclear testing program. Uh, red is the Soviet Union uh, uh, nuclear testing program, and here's Kazakhstan. Um, purple um, is, this purple is China, um, and then we have this kind of pink, which is the UK, some testing in Australia, and then um, a lot in, in Kiribati, we heard about 
um, Kiribati already. The U.S. also tested in Kiribati, um, as well as, of course, in the Marshall Islands and um, on its own territory in the American Southwest. So I'm going to, um, with when it comes to the Marshall Islands, so, you know, I think it's fair to say that the lion's share of nuclear testing took place in the Pacific. Uh, Marshall Islands were where the um, U.S. essentially wrote the playbook uh, for the nuclear testing era. Um, as you heard from Benedict, it was 67 tests, but that number simply doesn't do it justice because it was the equivalent of 7,000, as he said, and 200 um, nuclear bombs. So in the Marshall Islands, there were actually two testing sites. One is um, called Anawitak Atoll, and the other is the Bikini Atoll. Um, Bikini is a whole story in and of itself, um, and, and I think it, it, it goes, it's such a long-term trivialization of this issue through our popular culture where we all think of Bikini and we think of the swimsuit, and it's just, it's, it's maddening. Um, really, but I want you to think about Bikini Atoll um, and Bikini Island, where people were living prior to the testing. They uh, moved out in mid-February, and by the end of June, uh, the U.S. Um, began its, its test, and most of the tests done in the Marshall Islands were actually done in Bikini Atoll. This is a map of Bikini Island from just a couple of years ago. This is work um, that I have been involved in with uh, colleagues and students at Columbia University. We are looking at one kind of measurement. We've done uh, multiple studies, many different kinds of measurements. So I'm just showing you really just a couple of things. And this is a measurement of something called external background gamma radiation. That is, gamma radiation is just like, just like the light that we see. Um, it's just like x-rays, it's just like UV that you put sunscreen on to protect yourself from. It just has what are called um, much shorter wavelengths and it's much more energetic. So it can really harm your DNA, it can harm your cells and so on. We get exposed to gamma radiation from natural sources. Uh, what we're seeing here in the Marshall Islands is not natural at all. In, in other faraway islands, at sea level, gamma radiation is very, very low. Um, and so what you're seeing here is a map where the black dots indicate places where we made measurements, and the colors actually correspond to what sort of simulated values based on those measurements and what those values are. And I'll just tell you that the, so the color scheme is shown here on the, on the right, and you see everything from kind of purple to the dark red, so it sort of goes, you know, higher and higher and higher. And I'll just tell you that in the United States, um, there is a limit by the Environmental Protection Agency of 15 milligrams per year. That's the maximum that people can be exposed to if they live, for example, near a nuclear power plant. Um, uh, 15 would be purple in this map, uh, and we clearly see the bikini is not purple. Um, if anything, we see a lot of red. These are values that are about 30 times higher than that um, uh, limit that I mentioned in, um, uh, by the EPA. Um, so I'm going to show you another kind of measurement, and again, this is just these are just some of the measurements uh, uh, we can make to determine what the radiological conditions are like. Um, and this measurement pertains precisely to what uh, Benedict was referring to, which is, is the food safe? And it's one thing when we talk about this external gamma radiation and you can walk around and so on. It's another thing to take in food that actually then produces radiation inside your body. This kind of internal exposure is extremely, extremely dangerous to health. Cesium-137, this is a little chemistry lesson, um, is chemically similar to potassium. And you all know that when you eat a banana, you take in potassium. Um, and so 
not only uh, the cesium-137 is it capable of incorporating itself into the food so sources, uh, like bananas, in, in, it turns out in the Marshall Islands, it's coconuts and breadfruit and pandanas and so on, but it's also true that when we eat it, it incorporates itself. Some of our cells use potassium, and so it incorporates, like your brain actually needs potassium to function properly, um, and lots of soft tissues. It incorporates itself, and there, because it has this, because it releases gamma rays, now it's bombarding your cells from the inside. And so I'm also going to show you just a map of the Bikini Atoll. We've actually made measurements of over 20 different islands uh, in four different atolls in the Marshall Islands. But I'm showing you stuff uh, from Benedict's um, uh, grandmother's uh, uh, homeland. And here, uh, oops, sorry. Um, so here I have a different, it's again a kind of a color map. Um, and these are values that we actually sort of made this green to, to red color-coded um, uh, you know, uh, tra transfer of values uh, based on some of the limits that exist out there for what is a safe, considered to be safe amount of the cesium-137 in the food. Um, and um, I'm just going to point out that this first, the green values here uh, would actually um, comply with infant food requirements from Russia, Belarus, and Ukraine, three of the countries that would, uh, that um, dealt with the um, Chernobyl disaster and put forth these limits. Um, based on that. The, the blue color is actually uh, values that would violate those Belarus, um, Russia, and Ukraine limits, but would not violate. There's a Japanese limit um, that is not for infant food, it's for all other food that's 100. Um, and these units of becquerels per kilogram it's, are not important, but let's just call it 100. And then down here, the yellow would be um, violating the Japanese limit, um, but um, not violating the European Union's limit, which is 600 becquerels per kilogram uh, for regular food. And then orange would be violating the European Union's uh, limit, but not, uh, not violating the US FDA. The US FDA has by far the highest limit of what is permissible for cesium-137 um, in the food. And finally, uh, red values would violate that US FDA limit. And so what I hope you can see, it's probably difficult, but what I hope you can see is there are, we measured about 40 fruits on Bikini Island. There were no green fruits. Um, there were a couple of blue fruits. Um, most of the fruits were yellow. Uh, some were orange and several were even red. Uh, to this day, this food is not safe to eat. Um, and this is almost 70 years since the, um, sorry, 65 years since um, the testing ended uh, in the Marshall Islands. So let me just end on, let me just end on the scariest, most, depressing, I think, scientific data ever brought forth. Um, and it is, uh, it has to do with what the co humanitarian consequences of nuclear war would actually be. And this is sort of an interesting story because scientists discovered this first in the early 1980s after they figured out what happened to the dinosaurs 65 million years ago. So we figured out that 65 million years ago, an asteroid hit the Earth and created conditions that simply led to this mass extinction. It turns out that there were little mammals that could bury in the ground and 
um, survived on very little food and they sort of made it uh, um, and, and, and evolved into us today. But when scientists discovered this kind of mass extinction event, they um, tried to think whether there were conditions there was something that could happen today to create such conditions and essentially wipe out humanity. And they realized that actually we can create that ourselves. We can cause our own extinction. Um, and they named this um, nuclear winter, um, and you can also think of it as nuclear famine. So the idea is, is relatively simple. Um, the idea is that nuclear war um, would cause nuclear winter because um, you would release so much soot into the atmosphere, blocking incoming sunlight, reducing temperatures all around the globe, and essentially preventing food from growing. Um, and once food is not growing and ecosystems begin to collapse, food availability would go down significantly. Um, and people would begin to starve. Um, and this is actually a table from a fairly recent, so this has been, you know, there are 40 years worth of scientific work on this, but where we are now is really um, just state of the art work that's been enabled in many ways by all of the research that's been devoted to climate change. Um, so all of the models that we use for understanding how the increase in temperature will impact us have been used to also understand how the decrease in temperature would impact us. So I know it's hard to see, but I'm gonna, um, just point out a couple of these models. So these are different models based on how many um, nuclear warheads would be used, what the yield of those nuclear warheads would be, and then calculating the amount of soot, how much soot would be put out into the atmosphere. Let me just point out one thing, which is that nowadays we know that we put soot out when we have widespread wildfires, Right? That soot doesn't go so high up into the atmosphere. It actually stays fairly low and then rains down. Um, this kind of soot from nuclear explosions would go so far into the atmosphere, it would not rain down. rain down. It would stay there for several years, which is more than plenty for us to starve to death. So, um, uh, so let me just point out, the middle one is the scenario of India and Pakistan uh, using their nuclear arsenals. 127 million people would die from the direct attacks and over 2 billion would die um, from starvation. These numbers, the starvation numbers, are actually based on a worldwide population of 7 billion. We have now passed 8 billion, so you could easily add a billion to each of the numbers in the right column because having more people, there will not be more food. It will just be more people starving. Um, and then I'll point out the, the last um, scenario, which is the US and Russia using approximately one third of their arsenals. And we have 360 million deaths um, and, and again, this is five point, call it 5.4 billion. I would safely say that, that that's over, easily over six billion people um, dying of starvation. So what do we have to do? We have to get rid of nuclear weapons before they get rid of us. Nuclear zero is not impossible. Um, the TPNW is a way forward, and it is a way forward that's compatible um, with um, the NPT, because the NPT um, needs to um, come clean on its promises of nuclear disarmament. The other thing I'll point out, and it's been shared by um, our panelists already, is that the TPNW has humanitarian provisions for victim assistance and environmental remediation. And that is incredibly important work. Um, so thank you, I know I went a little over time, uh, but thank you so much.
short video by Dr. Becky Alexis Martin, the Assistant Professor of Peace and International Development at the University of Bradford. Dr. Becky Alexis Martin is unfortunately unable to be here in person as she's traveling right now to Peace and Silent in Fairfax. And she kindly provided a video for us. Hi, I'm Dr. Becky Alexis Martin um, and um, I'm at the University of Bradford um, Institute for Peace and International Development. Um, so I'm sorry I can't join you today, um, but it's my pleasure to still be able to um, talk to you a little bit about my work. Um, so those of you um, who don't know me um, might want a bit more information about what I do. Um, and um, so to give you some context, um, my research focuses on the lives and well-being of communities affected um, by nuclear weapons testing and nuclear warfare um, from 1945 to the present day. Um, and I've studied these communities internationally um, and written about um, the effects of nuclear warfare and nuclear weapons testing um, in my book um, called Disarming Doomsday. Um, so. Um, my most recent studies have explored um, the lives and experiences of families um, who have been affected by nuclear weapons um, due to having a veteran, a nuclear test veteran family member um, in the UK. Um, that study was called Nuclear Families and ran from 2015 to 2018. And my other larger study um, looked at communities um, affected by nuclear weapons um, in Carissimas, um, in the Republic of Kiribati. Um, and um, that study is ongoing, um, it's on to its second phase now. Um, so the first phase of that study addressed the humanitarian and environmental consequences of atmospheric nuclear weapons tests, um, following field work um, by myself um, and by Matt um, Bray Bolton um, in 2017 and 2018. Um, so this paper we put together, um, we um, worked with um, Dimity Hawkins, who's got an amazing project called um, the Nuclear um, it's Nuclear Peace Project. It's just astonishing. It's brilliant. Um, and um, Sidney Tish and um, Tale um, Lucia Mangioni as well. Um, and the purpose of our work um, was really to try and, um, you know, explore the impacts of the British um, and American nuclear weapons tests um, that arose um, from 1957 to 1962. Because um, during this time, um, the UK and USA tested 33 atmospheric nuclear weapon tests um, during the um, Grapple um, and um, the Operation Dominic series of nuclear weapon tests. Um, and my work, um, um, it explored um, kind of how the obligations of the 2017 Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons um, could kind of offer an important new opportunity to address the consequences of these nuclear detonations um, in Kiribati by focusing policy attention and constituting a new field um, of development assistance. So our argument for this paper our 2021 paper um, was that policy interventions to date haven't adequately addressed the needs and rights of survivors um, in the UK um, and the USA. Um, and um, our work explored how victim assistance and environmental remediation concerns um, um, and obligations for this treaty, so Article 6 and Article 7 of the TPNW, um, could offer an important new opportunity um, for addressing the consequences of nuclear detonations. Um, and looking at the humanitarian and human rights framing of effects on nuclear weapons testing offers an alternative to kind of denialism and the litigation and liability model as well. Um, and we also considered how the community seek not just medical assistance, but support for practices of recognition, acknowledgement and memorialisation to address psychosocial and cultural consequences of the test programmes themselves. And how these policy interventions should acknowledge the intrinsic value that many Pacific people place on the environment and not just its instrumental worth. Um, so this study has, um, you know, obviously shown that there's a need for greater support um, for the community. 
um, the next phase of my work um, is looking at atomic epistemic justice in Carissimus after the TPNW um, because it came into force in 2021 it's happening now which is amazing um, and um, so you know the community still isn't facilitated to engage with policy implementation mode um, and through no fault of their own, representative members aren't always um, able to be present um, or aren't always involved in UN TPNW events and debates, um, which represents what we call epistemic justice, so um, an injustice of knowledge um, as defined by Fricker 2007, um, whereby the community are not being heard. Um, and it's very important that the community of Carissimas are heard. It's very important that we know what the community want and that global policy listens, including and recognises their lived experience and we talk a lot about the importance of um, supporting um, survivors of nuclear weapons testing um, but we don't talk quite so much about the important you know and essential engagement and outreach strategies that are needed um, to ensure that um, the likelihood of successful support um, and receipt of appropriate reparations happens. Um, so my current work um, is kind of looking at what the community needs and wants um, and um, thinking about kind of how we can begin to ensure that the community is fully engaged um, now that we have ratification of the Treaty for a Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. So my work takes practical and academic steps towards understanding and addressing atomic epistemic justice in Carissimus um, and essentially kind of almost making people like me redundant. That's my hope, is that it will give the community a toolkit to advocate for themselves with autonomy and to say what they want and what they need with a comprehensive understanding of the Treaty for a Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons. So I'm engaging with local stakeholders um, and, um, you know, the community to discern TPMW knowledge baselines. Um, I'm providing participatory community workshops in plain language to co-produce TPMW knowledge. Um, and um, I'm um, discussing and identifying preferred um, TPMW engagement routes um, with local stakeholders and communities to put together a community-led nuclear involvement community engagement strategy um, with the aim, obviously, that the community decides what they want and how they want to do it and starts to think forward um, and you know gives them that space and that um, information so that they can do this. Um, I'll also be producing an extensive community database and um, both for the community of organisations that may be helpful to them um, and also for organisations of community members who want to participate and who want to be involved but haven't been included before. Um, and um, I'll identify opportunities to improve connectivity and communication through technology. So we know obviously that um, the Republic of Kiribati um, doesn't have always the technology that it deserves and needs to be a global player and to operate on a global, um, you know, global infrastructure. And um, so one of the things I'll be doing is looking at and surveying the community um, to think about kind of how we could improve this and improve that options for access. Um, the purpose of my study really is to kind of make myself redundant um, from a practical perspective um, and to help the community move forward um, and decide with dignity what they want and what they need um, in light of the um, Article 6 and Article 7 um, of the um, Treaty for the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons um, thinking forward to things like the possibility of a future trust fund for humanitarian and environmental justice to be produced. Um, so um, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking to you. If you want to get in touch with me about my research, um, you can email me at the University of Bradford. Um, my email is b.alexis-martin at bradford.ac.uk. Otherwise, um, I wish you all the best uh, with the MPT. Um, it's a really important event um, and, um, you know, I've, I'll be cheering you all on um, from the Pacific. Thank you so much for your time. Goodbye. Thank you very much, Chair. I'd like to thank Dalit Scott, Gary Bosch, and the Marshall Islands and uh, the Research Foundation for uh, organizing and 
is sponsoring uh, this event. I wanted to make four points. The first is a question to Mr. Jangel Jisterimbet of Kazakhstan, and this relates to the joint working paper submitted by Kazakhstan and Kiribati, which is working paper 27, in particular to paragraph 21 and 23. So in paragraph 21, it is said that the recognition of the responsibilities of the nuclear weapon states, as well as those states that rely on defense arrangements based on nuclear weapons for the humanitarian and environmental consequences. But in paragraph 23, where financial compensation uh, is requested, only the nuclear weapon states are identified. So my question is, why are not those countries that are in defense arrangements that are underpinned by nuclear weapons not also held responsible for providing compensation because of course these countries benefit from the results of nuclear weapons testing in, uh, in affected communities even though they may not have tested these devices themselves. Now until June this year, we had roughly 12,500 nuclear weapons of course, possessed by nine nuclear weapon states, but they were um, present in 14 countries. And as of June, we have 14 plus one country. And uh, there were 107 locations where these weapons were deployed, and after June, it's 107 plus one or maybe two. So the role of nuclear weapons is increasing and not decreasing, which is in stark contrast to what the nuclear weapon states and their allies have accepted in various NPT uh, review conferences. So in this regard, um, uh, I appreciated the statement made by uh, the Nuclear Peace Age Foundation on the compatibility of the TPNW with the NPT. And I was completely astounded by the intervention by the Netherlands yesterday and the previous day by Lithuania on the compatibility of NATO nuclear sharing with the non-proliferation treaty. Nothing could be further from the truth. So I will quote to you the statement by the Netherlands, which was, I think, in a right of a reply. It says, NATO nuclear arrangements have always been and continue to be fully consistent with the NPT. False. It's a completely false narrative. And second, uh, these nuclear arrangements have seamlessly integrated or the seamless integration of NATO's nuclear sharing arrangements into the NPT, which has long been accepted and publicly understood by all states parties in the NPT. Again, it's also. So I hope other non-nuclear weapon states will challenge such falsehoods. So instead of arguing for the compatibility of the TPNW with the NPT, here a claim is being made that having nuclear weapons in non-nuclear weapon states, which in time of war will be delivered by the air forces of non-nuclear weapon states hosting these nuclear weapons, they might be under joint command for the release of nuclear weapons, but nonetheless, we have non-nuclear weapon state pilots piloting warplanes of non-nuclear weapon states, carrying nuclear weapons, so therefore they are under the control of non-nuclear weapon states, again, incompatible with the non-proliferation treaty. Now, in the presentation by the Nuclear Peace Age Foundation, where uh, it was showed the locations where nuclear weapon tests took place, I would suggest to also consider uh, the events which took place on the 22nd of September 1979 at 12.53 GMT, where a US uh, electronic uh, reconnaissance satellite called the Vela picked up a double flash of an atmospheric test uh, south of South Africa. Months later, the thyroids of sheep in Western Australia were discovered to be contaminated with iodine uh, 131. And so if the sheep thyroids were contaminated, obviously the people living in Perth and in that belt of Western Australia, bordering the Indian Ocean, very likely also received this dose of iodine. Uh, so this, this is yet another affected uh, community, and perhaps uh, the other affected communities might consider reaching out to them. And a point that I made yesterday in another uh, event 
was that we're seeking compensation from the nuclear weapon states, and I would also suggest the states benefiting from nuclear weapons to um, consider uh, a class action suit of some sort to go to the International Court of Justice filed by the two countries sponsoring uh, these, uh, this particular discussion for compensation uh, for the trust fund that we are seeking to uh, establish. And my final comment is uh, relating to the Hiroshima and Nagasaki uh, use of nuclear weapons. So nuclear weapons have been used twice, although in our discourse we seem to pretend that nuclear weapons were only used once, but they've been used twice. And if there is, unfortunately, we get another use of nuclear weapons, that would be the third, third time. So I was on a panel established by the then Foreign Minister of Japan, uh, Mr. Kishida, who is now the current Foreign Minister, and on that panel was Dr. Masahiko Tomonaga. He's the head of the Japanese Red Cross and also the director of the Nagasaki Atomic Bomb Hospital. And he claimed that the medical data of the survivors of the Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombings was not shared with the Japanese medical authorities for at least 15 years after the bombs were, just, were, uh, were uh, dropped on these two cities. So it means that these two survivors, the Hibakusha, were treated as medical experiments. Otherwise, why would not the data be shared with the Japanese government so that uh, medical care and humiliation could be provided to uh, the surviving uh, Hibakusha? So with that, I would like to thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Rao, for your excellent and comprehensive questions and comments. Uh, given the presentations by our esteemed experts, uh, we can understand and see that all weapons of mass destruction, including nuclear weapons, are immoral because the only purpose, and probably the only purpose, is not to protect but to destroy. There are two dimensions of this uh, universe. First is moral and the other one is uh, legal. Uh, everyone in the world understands that uh, these, these weapons are immoral. However, just states parties to the treaty on the prohibition of nuclear weapons uh, confirm that they are illegal. Uh, in, in terms of uh, our paper, uh, we outlined that it should be provided adequate justice to the victims of nuclear weapons related activities. And uh, speaking realistically, uh, we would rather go with the uh, voluntary uh, approach. Uh, you know, there are also some rumors that. Uh, if nuclear weapons possessive states provide compensation, this uh, might be a, a sort of justification of their immoral activities. Uh, and some states participate to the treaty uh, of the defendant would not agree to such approach, that they sh should first uh, accede to the treaty and then provide all the rest of the uh, implementation action plans to the Article 6 and 7. Uh, that is why we, we would rather go with this uh, voluntary activity as the trust fund. And, and uh, so we hope that the success of the implementation of the PNW will be uh, a good reason for others to join. And then, of course, to reach, uh, maybe not in the near future, we hope, but in the midterm, uh, the world free of nuclear weapons. Uh, but it depends, of course, on the political will uh, and uh, wisdom of, first of all, nuclear weapon states. And we encourage them to uh, uh, sit down and uh, increase confidence building measures, negotiations which can come to the reduction and to the total elimination of nuclear weapons. Uh, maybe my esteemed colleague would, would like to add 
to this question. And if not, I hope I answered your question. Thank you. for mentioning the South Africa test um, and, and the information about IDAM 131. I mean, that's the, so much of what we see in terms of that immediate impact is about IDAM 131, which doesn't persist in the environment um, uh, as long, actually has a half-life of eight days, and so within several weeks, completely gone. Things like cesium-137, which I spoke about, um, uh, that isotope has a half-life of 30, about 30 years, so that means it's around for hundreds of years, a couple hundred years, uh, at least. Another isotope I didn't mention is strontium-90, which behaves like calcium, and we have some evidence that that's present in the Marshall Islands as well. Um, and so that's really uh, an important observation. I agree with you that the ICJ would be an ideal venue um, to bring these issues forward. The problem, of course, is that so many of the states that we're talking about would not be party to any sort of um, litigation uh, because they just they just refuse to be a, a, a a party, and, and that's where obviously the advisory opinion is, is and could be helpful, but it's also not binding. It's not something they have to act on. Um, but thinking about ways to, um, to, to bring these issues into the international sphere, you know, within the treaty and perhaps beyond the treaty, I agree with you, it's absolutely and to me, um, this kind of work is truly about um, uh, righting the historical wrongs, but it is also about the lessons for the present and the future of what we do not want to repeat and what we do not want to happen again. Um, so thank you, thank you so much.